This is Pastor Bill Sang of Finley Grace Brethren Church. I would like to thank you for joining me for today's podcast. Join us at 10.30 a.m. on Sundays at Finley Grace Brethren Church. Enjoy today's sermon. And as you heard me saying earlier, today we're going to be talking about fear. We're going to be talking about fear and how Jesus taught that we should not be afraid and how to deal with that fear. And uh, But also to be aware there is one thing that we that is actually truly worthy of our fear. And we're going to get into that in just a moment. What I'm amazed with is the courage displayed last week from the people that were baptized. Uh, There is lots of things that you could have been afraid of last week. Fear of what people might think of you. Fear of being in front of people. And possibly fears that something could go wrong as the baptisms were taking place. But you are an example to the church and to your families that you showed them that it is worth it to overcome any fears you might have been experiencing for the sake of being obedient to God. But why should we be afraid? Because we know that God is at work in our midst, as many of our testimonies have reflected this morning. Now, last week, as you'll recall, I deviated from the series that we've been on inside of Matthew to talk about baptism. But this week, we are actually returning to the Gospel of Matthew. And last time we were in Matthew, we were studying what I like to call the trenches. Uh, The apostles were being warned by Jesus of times that would be difficult. The world was going to hate them because it hated Jesus first. He warned them that they had to be wise as serpents and as gentle as doves because they were going to be persecuted. The authorities were going to hunt them down, arrest them, and even bring them on trial before the great rulers of the world. In God's plan, this would all be done for the sake of spreading the gospel. Although Jesus taught that such persecution is indeed an honor, we have to admit, it is a little bit scary to think about the idea that people may hate us for the sake that we love Jesus and want to proclaim his love and the message of salvation to the world. It's very unusual that people react so, uh, for lack of a better way of putting it, negatively towards such a great message. So today, we look at what Jesus said to do with that fear as he continued to address his disciples. And we're going to be doing that by reading Matthew chapter 10, 24 through 33. And we're going to read that right now. So follow along with me inside your Bibles if you have them handy. It reads, A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and a servant like his master. <clears throat> if they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? So to have no fear of them, for nothing is covered that will not be revealed, or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, (coughs) fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are are all numbered. (coughs) Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. One of the most frightening times in my life was actually shortly after Melissa and I were married. We'd moved into our new home. And uh, when we were there one night, we happened to hear this this loud crash and some rustling coming from our bedroom. And so we thought that, oh, wow, it's possible somebody may have just broken in to our home. And so I I started to make my way over there, kind of inched and listened to see if I could hear anything. I hadn't heard anything. And as I got closer and closer, I reached for the doorknob, started to turn the doorknob, and all of a sudden I heard another crash and some rustling. So at that point, I am absolutely certain that somebody is invading our home. So what I ended up doing is I ended up calling uh, one of my brothers up to see if he could come over. As we were waiting, I picked up a chair to use as a weapon if I needed to, and I started calling out threats to whoever or whatever it was that was invading 
It was a situation that lasted about an hour, but I finally mustered up the courage uh, to finally make my way back to that room. And when I made it to that room and opened up the door, there was two things that I noticed. First of all, <clears throat> I noticed that there was no one in the room. And the second thing I noticed was that the window was closed. Okay, so this is kind of a mysterious situation because like, I knew that I heard something. Melissa knew that she had heard something, but what was it? Were, were, were we just going crazy together or something? I don't know. And so I started looking around the room and as I searched the room and tried to make heads or tails out of the situation, what I noticed is that by the window, there was a large poster that had fallen. And I thought to myself, I think that that's what it was. I was like, but what was the second sound? Well, over on the other wall, closer to the doorway, was another large poster that had fallen. Well, what are the odds that two large posters would fall in such sequence that one of them, to startle us the first time, and the second one, to confirm our fears, and think that there is somebody running around inside of our bedroom. So there is no break-in, no intruder, not even a boogeyman had been terrorizing a home. Just a couple of posters had fallen and frightened us. Reminds me very much of what Franklin Roosevelt had said all those years back. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. I also heard, and I don't know if this is exact statistic, but I don't think it's scientific anyway, but they say that nine times out of ten, your worst fear will not come to pass. And in fact, I would venture to say that the statistics, statistics <laughs> are probably even more staggering than that. I would say probably more around the ballpark of 99% of the time that your worst fears will never come to pass. And if you don't believe me, let me give you an example from my own fears. Um, people that know me won't know that I have a fear of heights. But what I'll tell them back if they say that is that, no, I am not afraid of heights. I'm afraid of falling. Now, when I think about that, when push comes to sub, I actually cannot think of a single time when I was put in a situation where I had to be up high on a platform of some sort where I fell. Can't think of a single time where that had happened. Now, that's not to say that it doesn't happen to anybody, but it's never happened to me. My fear has never been confirmed by the fact that I'd fallen off of a high place. And I, I think we can even extrapolate this idea further. It's not merely that bad things are not statistically likely to happen. Rather, the ultimate truth of the matter is that you and I aren't going to die until the Almighty has decided to receive us. Does that sound reasonable? We're not going to die until God is ready to receive us. King David wrote in Psalm 139, Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. And so he's saying that, uh, that before any of my days were even happening on this earth, God, you already knew how many days I was going to be alive. You knew the day I was going to be born, and you knew the day that I was going to die. So nothing will happen to you. Nothing will happen to me until God has so determined. And in that respect, we ought not be fearful of death because our day will not catch God surprise. It will not catch God by surprise. It might catch a lot of people by surprise, but it will not catch God by surprise. And as such a benevolent and powerful being is the one who has written our days as in a book, should we not fully trust that his timing is what is best for us? Jesus said, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny, and not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father? But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. In our passage for today, there are at least five things that we might be afraid of. And we're uh, we fear all sorts of things, yet few of those things that frighten us are actually worthy of our attention. Jesus addressed one of the most common fears that people have, which is the first fear I'm going to be talking about here. The first fear I want to discuss with you is the fear of death. Because Jesus knew that as soon as his disciples went into the world to share the gospel, that death was going to be around every corner. Now, 
As a side note, I've kind of done a little bit of research on the fear of death and on fears in general. And when I discovered that and this kind of blows my mind, especially since I'm in a position like this, is that people oftentimes say that they're more afraid of public speaking than what they are of death. That kind of surprised me a little bit, but oddly enough, it's one of those uh, uh, statistical realities. So Jesus knew that death was going to be facing his apostles around every corner, and of course, that would be their experience. And the reason that would be is because, um, because even though death had been defeated by the cross, by Jesus, and the news of the resurrection would give people hope of eternal life, that nonetheless, death would continue to be a bully amongst the disciples and all of those who would believe in the name of Jesus. So death in an instant, in, in, in a um, manner of speaking, would try to intimidate and to scare the apostles, prevent them from spreading that message. When I think about that, I kind of think of a long time ago, back <clears throat> when I was in high school, my dad had a couple of fish tanks, okay? And uh, one of the tanks he kind of liked to experiment with, with different sorts of life. And uh, the particular creature I'm thinking about right now that he had at one point were crabs. Okay, so these crabs, they were escape artists through and through. They climbed on everything, and they would even get on top of the tank. They would get out of the tank, on top of the, on top of the tank, and they'd be running around on it. And they would stop when you would see them, and they'd just stare at you. And the males, what they would do is they would lift up their big clawed hand as though they're shaking their fist at you, challenging you to a fight. And so these crabs, they think they're all tough. They think they're bad. They think that they're just going to pinch your finger until you can take no more, I guess. Um, but all you had to do was grab them by that claw, open up the tank, and drop them back in. So they're pretty harmless to a human, but that didn't stop them from trying I, I think of death in that same respect. Yes, death does have some real ramifications. Death actually does happen on this, on this earth. But death, like I said, had been defeated by Jesus Christ at the cross. So in the end, death could destroy our bodies, but it cannot destroy our souls. So we should not fear death. The second sort of fear that Jesus alluded to, and I would like to address as well, is shame. Shame. And shame can take a variety of forms. But it always seems to result in us wanting to hide or hide something. And nothing exemplifies this better than the first act of shame in the Garden of Eden. Mankind was commanded not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And when tempted, both Adam and Eve did partake of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so when they did that, they became ashamed. And they became ashamed, particularly in two ways. The first way... They cover themselves with clothes made out of fig leaves, and that was because they had become ashamed unto one another because they had realized that they were not wearing any clothes. And then the next way that they displayed their shame is that when they heard the voice of God, they hid because they knew they had disobeyed God and they knew that he would be displeased with what they had done. And so they ran away and they hid. Now, in our reading, it says, um, all things will be revealed. One way or another, even our secret deeds will be laid bare before God. In fact, he sees them clearly right now as they are. So there's no need to hide from him. And confessing our sins to God is a good thing. But the worst sort of shame that we can, that, that, uh, we can express isn't even our shame over sin. Because sin in itself actually is shameful. We should bring it out into the open so that we can experience the heights of forgiveness that God offers us. Nonetheless, we do see that shame indeed is, is shameful inherently. We should never be ashamed of Jesus, though. We should never be ashamed of Jesus. And the third type of fear that I would like you to recognize is actually related to shame, and that is the fear of man. Jesus said that everyone who acknowledges, acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. I think of Jesus' disciple Peter after Jesus was arrested. Peter eventually got mixed up into a crowd that was observing 
the proceedings of Jesus' interrogation. And then out of nowhere, people started affiliating Peter with Jesus. They said, we've seen you with him. We hear your Galilean accent, and we know that you're one of his followers. And Peter denied his relationship with Jesus so fervently until he realized what it was that he had done. Because of fear, it is easier to sink into the crowd and not be affiliated with Jesus or his teachings. But we don't want the Lord to be ashamed of us, so we ought not be ashamed of him. Why are we so afraid of people anyway? I mean, we fear people rejecting us because of our faith in Jesus. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And the reason I say it doesn't make a whole lot of sense is because, well, you know, people's opinions are stupid, right? People's opinions are stupid. And you know what? Sometimes I have stupid opinions. Sometimes you have stupid opinions. Sometimes the people that love us and care about us the most have stupid opinions. Of course. That's what I was getting at, actually. <laughs> it reminds me of one of my favorite verses, though. Let God be true and every man a liar. From time to time, we're all going to be wrong about things. Our job is to align ourselves with God. We need the humility to be able to say that I might have thoughts on this matter or that matter, but what really matters is what God has declared to be true. We shouldn't fear people. The fourth kind of fear, the fear of Satan. The fear of Satan. Don't be afraid of Satan. The Bible tells us that if we resist him, that he will flee. And one of the biggest lies is that he holds the power to destroy your soul. Now, Satan is a lot of bad things. He's a tempter, he's a tormentor, a murderer, but he doesn't have the power to destroy your soul. His destination is the same as anyone else who stands defiant against God. We know that he is on a crash course with hell. Jesus broke the power of Satan on your life when he died on the cross. So even though he's still up to his devious schemes, you have power through the Holy Spirit to overcome each one of them. So don't be afraid of Satan because the one who dwells inside of you is greater than the one who is in the world. So don't fear death. Don't live in shame. Don't fear man. Don't fear Satan. Now, I, I mentioned earlier on that there is one thing worthy of your fear in this world. And to some of you, I don't know, this might surprise you. I think that some of you already know what I'm going to say, though, as well. But the fifth type of fear, the one thing worthy of our fear, the fear of God. The only person we're fearing is God. Jesus said, do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. And of course, right here, he's actually talking about God himself. And throughout the Bible, a phrase is used, the fear of the Lord. And this phrase communicates the idea that God is worthy of you and I fearing him. And we're not comfortable with the idea of the fear of the Lord. Most commentators today will say that the fear of the Lord is actually just respect for the Lord. And well, sort of, there are times where that might be the more applicable uh, use of the word for it. But uh, when you do a search on the word for fear inside of the Bible, that it actually translates to be literally to be afraid, to be fearful. Now, what does that mean? Because, okay, so okay, you're saying I need to be afraid of God. What am I doing here then, right? <laughs> well, what it's saying is that we're not supposed to cower from God or hide ourselves from God or even tremble at the thought of God. Remember, God already sees and knows everything. So you can't escape God. And there's no reason to be afraid of God in that respect that we're running from him. Because why? Well, God loves us and we love God. And since we love God, we know who he is. He is holy. He is mighty. He is judge. And when we consider the consequences for evil, for sin, for those who have not placed their faith in Jesus, God's wrath is a dreadful thought. 
Because we know that evil is going to be punished. We ought to consider that the sins that tempt us are the reason why Jesus died on the cross. As believers, each time we sin, it is indeed an insult to Jesus. He didn't die so that you could keep on sinning. He died that you may be forgiven of your sins. We should fear God because the punishment for sin is death. So what are you afraid of these days? Is it a person? Is it a circumstance? Is it an activity or an endeavor that you just can't get out of? I want you to remember something. Bravery doesn't mean that you are not afraid. Bravery is doing what's right even when you are afraid. It is in Jesus that we truly see how to cast out fear. Now, I, I don't know that Jesus was actually definably afraid, but we do read about a time when he was in deep anguish. He knew that he was going to be arrested. He knew that he was going to be tortured. He knew that he was going to die a humiliating and painful death while carrying your sins and my sins on his shoulders. The sins of the entire world that he did not commit. He had to bear all of those on the cross. And he was so troubled by this that he prayed to the Father for another way to achieve his will and bring the forgiveness of sins. But he concluded, as you can remember inside of the scriptures, where he says, but your will be done. So Jesus chose to be courageous in the midst of his deep anguish. Jesus still went to the cross and died for our sins. But here is the hope that Jesus held on to, by the way. Jesus knew the end game of it all. And he knew that he was going to bring about the forgiveness of our sins. But what I think that our ultimate goal here on earth is, not what I think it is, what it is, uh, is to glorify God. And that was Jesus' ultimate goal too, that even though he wanted to accomplish the forgiveness of sins, his ultimate goal was to glorify God. And in Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, we see that he had this hope in his mind that we are told that since he was obedient even to dying on a cross, it says, God has highly exalted him and bestowed him on him uh, and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and underneath the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So ultimately he brought glory to God the Father by dying on the cross because his name was exalted exalted to the glory of God the Father. Jesus was exalted above all. You and I that will be exalted if we stand firm in the name of Jesus. And thus we too will bring glory to God through uh, to, to God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit through our obedience. So we have no reason to be ashamed in his name. He conquered death broke Satan's power, and made peace with God on our behalf. And yes, although we fall short from time to time and bring dishonor to God through Jesus Christ, even those sins have been forgiven. So you can live your life, not in fear, but in victory, knowing that you are forgiven and that God will never abandon you. Now we can face all circumstances with courage. God has broken the power of death, shame, and Satan. And the one we should fear, he's the one who makes us brave. So let's let our hearts rest with Christ. Please join me for a word of prayer. Father God, we praise you that indeed, even though you are the one that we should fear that we are now brought to peace with you in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. That, Lord, all these other things in the world that are legitimately scary have no power over us. And then, indeed, at the times that they do start to invoke fear, we can take heart in you, knowing that your Son, Jesus, overcame the world and he gives us the power to overcome the world as well. So, Father God, I pray that as we go from here today, we remember this great hope 
that we have in your son, Jesus Christ. That he died a death that we deserved. He rose again in glory. And that, Father, we too will be raised, if your son has been raised, if we have faith in him. So, Father God, now that death is no longer our master, your son is our master. We know that we have hope of life eternal. We thank you for this. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>